go time. We see that there are undercover police officers outside. Years later, when I turned myself in, I was told that they would actually do that. Hi. I'm Kane Vincent Dyer. I did approximately over 100 bank robberies. My name is John Panisi. I'm a former made member of the Lucchese crime family. My name is Mark Silverman. My name is Peter Tritton. Hi, my name is Octav Duram. Today we're going to be looking at mafia scenes, bank robbery scenes, drug trafficking, art heist, Irish mob movie scenes, and we're going to judge how real they are. What do you get, your period? One thing about bars, too, is you always know who's coming in and out. So you have a good idea if there's strangers in there or if there's something that doesn't look right. You can really find out if somebody's there to infiltrate the bar or cause trouble. No! No! Are you still a cop? No! No! That's a great scene. I, I, I could tell you one thing, and, and it struck me right away when I saw the movie for the first time. The state police are not going to try to put one of their own inside of a crew especially a dangerous crew. That's why they recruit informants or top echelon informants because the informants can walk the walk and talk the talk. And I have never really seen an undercover police officer inside of a crew. A lot of people used to say, well, you know, I know that guy's a cop because of his shoes. I would say, you don't think that they know what shoes to wear and what not to wear? You know, yeah, always, always looking over your shoulder for that, yeah. you know. I saw a cop when I came in here, yeah. when I was pulling into the parking lot. I didn't miss that. But these days, I don't have to worry about it. The guys on the street like me that are looking at it are saying, wow, that's pretty good. School's out. Thank you, Frank. Police corruption back in the 80s and the 90s was rampant. Whitey Bulger certainly wasn't the only guy that had the inside track with some of the departments, whether they be local or state or federal. Other guys, I mean, you're not going to survive on the street if you don't have friends within law enforcement. And back then, you know, police didn't really make as much money as they did today, and they were much more easily corrupted. As we moved on to the 2000s, I think that uh, they got a little more stringent you know they, they wanted to eradicate organized crime they wanted to just put that final nail in the coffin which they claim to have done several times we're not even supposed to be doing this this close to worcester this side of worcester says who says him says uh, costello this is very accurate so they're obviously nervous it's all about territory if you're dealing drugs Doing any type of business in somebody else's territory, you are absolutely open to discipline. However that discipline is carried out, it depends on the severity of the action. Like if you look at like Medford, you know, Somerville, you know, Winter Hill, South Boston, you know who's who and you know where you should be doing things and where you shouldn't. Because if you don't, someone will get your attention one way or another and you probably won't like it. But that's what happens. You know, he's got some real good scenes in there and uh, good storyline. So, yeah, I'd say it's pretty accurate. I'd give it a, I'd give it a seven. Listen, I uh, just wanted to stop by and tell you myself. Is that the zip code for South Boston? Uh, no, it's Charlestown. Everybody has the, the fighting Irish guy usually, like, on, yeah. their, on their calf, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's, it's not really like a... A requirement or anything it's just that they're proud I mean and they should be they they're always gonna honor and respect it where they come from I think my guys can handle it without me you know what I mean I wouldn't hire them without you and I wouldn't hire you without them you're a unit everybody in a crew has a role part of his crew is the bank robbery crew he's not gonna put your flipper on it you know he's not gonna do that he's not gonna hire one without the other they're gonna do it together they do it right they do it well they keep the money flowing the Irish Mafia, I mean, they're, they're loosely knit crews, you know, that don't necessarily follow the, uh, the pyramid of the structure of power that the Italians have. You have your bookies, you have your drug dealers, you have your hijackers. Everybody has a role. But the earner, the guy that fill in the pockets of the higher-ups, is the most important guy in that crew. Just out of respect, smooth things over. 
take this part, all right? Not gonna cut it. You're gonna do what I ask. Yeah, he don't want his money. You know, he's much more valuable to him continuing to make money, you know. Your earners, you, you will do anything to keep them earning for you because they're hard to find, believe me when I tell you. You know, there's a lot of knuckleheads out there that uh, you put them on the street, you know, they last about a week. It's like, in reality too, it's the old timers that really have the juice. I always respected the old timers more than anything because these guys have more wisdom in their pinky finger than the guys that are young. That's a nine. I think that's probably why I haven't seen this movie <laughs> because that seems kind of crazy, kind of elaborate to do a hit. I didn't know that mob hitmen were acrobats and stuntmen. It just seems like a lot of unnecessary work to get your message across. Our feet may swiftly carry out thy command, so we shall flow a river forth to thee, and teeming with souls shall it ever be. I don't know a lot of Irish mobsters that, that talk like that. It's like a little bit of what, the brogue? You know, most of them were born here. You know, they don't come over from Dublin or yeah. anything like that. Maybe I met one or two. I'm not quite sure. It was a long time ago with that, but I'm giving it a two. Oh. Right, that's enough. Man, just f***ing like that, I was Winter Hill. So a lot of people believe that Whitey Bulger was part of the Winter Hill gang. He was at the beginning. I don't think I would ever say he was the leader of the Winter Hill gang. He was the leader of the Bulger group, or whatever you want to call it. He was running with the gangs in South Boston. There was a power struggle, and they wanted to iron out those problems, and the ultimate result of it was, hey, let's combine it, you know? Why don't we make ourselves strong? Why don't we blend Southie and Winter Hill and make it all one crew? And that's what they did. But in 1978, all of a sudden this huge indictment comes down against the entire Winter Hill gang. I mean, guys like Whitey, Stevie, Howie, John Matarano, the who's who of the Irish Mafia in 1978. And it's funny because as it was taking its course, you know, these guys either went on the limb or some of them went to jail or were awaiting trial. All of a sudden, you hear the word unindicted co-conspirators when it came to Steve Flemmy and Whitey Bulger. So an unindicted co-conspirator kind of raised a lot of antennas. And again, that's where people fail to realize is that once he eliminates Winter Hill, he becomes the Bulger group. I told him everything. The IRA, Cahill, the whole bit. This will be dead before Stevie pulls your teeth. Accurate. Accurate. He says to Stevie Flummy, he says, all right, take his teeth out. You know, back in those days, they didn't have DNA. Yes. You know, so they would identify bodies by dental records. I think uh, in the movie, too, they, they refer to um, a dumping ground where they... Dumped a lot of bodies, yeah. you know, quite a few. Yeah. I remember when the state police were digging it up. It was bad, yeah. it was really bad. I thought Depp was great. Yeah. Everything down from the, you know, to the walk, to the eyes. You know, Whitey had these eyes that were like grayish blue with like no emotion behind them. And uh, I, I think you'll see a lot of times in this movie when they showed the eyes, like they'll focus specifically on the eyes. They looked pretty good. I'm giving this one an eight. I thought this one was gritty. It was raw. It was pretty accurate. Ever since you come in the restaurant, you can't stop yakking at smoochy this, smoochy that. I always wore the scally cap, and I was kind of a tracksuit type of guy. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Irish guys wear them. It's not a requirement, you know. Yeah. You know I just like them. You're a good boy, Mopes. Don't think we don't remember favors. You're welcome at our place anytime. Come on, boys. The Irish will work with anybody that's making money, that's willing to work with them. I mean, there was like a big ethnic stew of, 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 of people. You know, you didn't have to be a certain, you know, religion or, like I said, ethnicity. There was Italians, there was Polish, there was Jewish. If you have talent, you can earn they don't really care what your last name is or what your religion is. You know, it's about money. You can make the money, you know, you can be as, <laughs> you know, 
you can be an atheist. I don't know, maybe a six, five, right around there. What the hell? Transferring them to Riker. Let's go. Sorry, baby. If a guy goes to jail, you know, I mean, he's risking that. He's risking losing his family. We got to have um, money, you know, our envelopes. You're welcome. There was less in it than what we were expecting. And so? Guys go to jail 10, 12, 14 years, and they come out with nothing. And what they come out to is most times their friends have betrayed them and taken over the businesses that they had and never took care of them, never went to their wife and said, hey, you know, here's a little package, you know. I mean, I think you should take care of them. They're supposed to, okay. but don't expect it. You know, you see what this whole organized crime thing has become. Disloyalty, no honor amongst thieves anymore. All everybody wants to do is look out for A number one. I left organized crime because I saw the direction that it was going. I saw guys that lost their families and were betrayed by their best friends and it was just too much and I realized that I made the wrong decisions in my life. How much were you expecting from me? Payments are down. Well, the collections are down? Who's not paying? Collections are always down. You know, I mean, most mob guys are, are great actors and, and, and their best performances are when they're crying poor mouth. We know you did a score for 80000 but you have no money. You know, you can't even buy a cup of coffee. Come on. In that scene where she was asking for the money, you know, he's got the money, believe me, but uh, not giving it to her. You know, something maybe about a five. Yeah, here's a few bucks for you. Lucky you're getting that. Now, don't sit down here. Get over there. Now, come on, sit down. Man, I'm f***ing with you. Hey, can you get, get him a drink? You need to talk. I think it's a great scene. Okay. I really do. I mean, they're just hanging out, having a few beers. It seemed like there were other patrons in the place. You know, if you're in a mob bar or a social club or whatever, sometimes they'll just come over to the table and just whisper something in your ear or just say, you know, come to the back room in 10 minutes, I gotta talk to you. You're two out there on your own and we don't see a dime. We don't run around like a couple of f***ing Aaron boys for you for 15 years and what do we have to show for it? Nothing. I like the way that the boss let them know that, you know, look, you guys got to kick up. And these guys are saying, they're standing their ground saying, look, we do the scores, man. You know, I got kids to feed. You know, what are we, Aaron boys? And obviously, if they've been doing it 15 years, they're far from Aaron boys. Never tell how, many, how, how much money you made on a score because, believe me, people will chase you down. Like, I remember I specifically did one that was really, really big. And it was a windfall. And I had people coming from every direction. As soon as someone hears you did a big score in town, they got their hand out. Most guys live score to score. You know, if, if you hit a score, you know, you want to take a little time off. You know, you got it. You got the money. We're not setting up IRAs. We're not diversifying our stock portfolios. We're not thinking about, we're thinking about today. We're thinking about spending that money because we know that once we run out, just go out and do another one. You know, it's not a long term <laughs> business that uh you know you can retire from you know that's why you see guys out there that are 75 80 years old that are still hustling i'm gonna go probably eight and a half i really like this my name is peter tritton aka posh pete i am a former drug trafficker namely cocaine from beginning of 2003 till the end of 2005 i served at just over 10 years imprisonment in ecuador Today we will be watching clips from movies and TVs about drug trafficking. Let me show you distribution. How many dealers? 28. Looking to triple that. They've got about 48 people in this scene, <laughs> let alone the dealers. Having that amount of drugs in one place at one time with that amount of people, it's just such, it would be such high risk. All the different parts of the operation are all in one place. Never. Each individual mechanism or part would be separate to the other. So the people that had the safe house, they wouldn't know the people that were in the lab. The people in the lab wouldn't know the drivers. So if any one part got hit by the police, they couldn't link, couldn't be linked to the others. I would give this a five just because it's all just too much in one place. Before long, we were seizing 60 kilos of coke a day. That could 
happen. I mean, there was an instance a few years ago in Spain where boxes of bananas were literally getting delivered to shops and they were taking out the top layer of bananas and the rest was full of cocaine. The flower industry in South America, particularly Colombia, is huge. So any cover good, as we call it. But generally, cartels don't send large amounts like this unless they've got customs either paid off or they know they've got a guaranteed in. For the authorities to get big hits like this, it means something's probably gone wrong somewhere along the line, obviously. For the cartel, that is. We felt we were making a huge difference. If you look at the name on the boat, it's Guayaquil. That's the city that I was imprisoned in, in Ecuador. That's the main drug trafficking route out of Ecuador up to Central America and then on into America. I was in prison with several people who were working on the boats. They were captains of boats. Truth is, we weren't even making a dent. In that tube, I mean, the, you know, the, they, they tended to fit the cocaine to the shape of whatever it was packed in, in order to maximize how uh, the amount you can get in there. They let us have 60 so they could bring in 600. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. The cartel's giving up drugs so that they can bring in more. Maybe they do. I've been in prison with people from the Sinaloa cartel, and I've never heard them say that they did that. Ojita magica. This scene is very, is very realistic, where they've got the, the sort of temporary camp set up out in the jungle somewhere, processing the leaves. I mean, the volumes of chemicals that they're using. In South America, they have the chemicals highly controlled now, so it's very difficult to, for them to buy the volumes that they need. For one kilo of cocaine with ether, you need at least six or seven liters per kilo. So you imagine if they're making, you know, three, four hundred kilos a day, that, that you're talking about tanker loads of chemicals. I doubt you would be given access to a laboratory like that. If you'd be given away its location and where it was, you'd be revealing the whole makeup just for a kilo when they're producing 300 kilos a day. If you're talking to a guy that's running a lab like this, you've got to be buying, I would have thought, minimum 50 or 100. The way that they're dressed in, in these scenes is typical because these guys working in the labs, they're out in the middle of a jungle. You know, you're not going to be showing off to anybody in there. The actual workers are very poorly paid. You know, it's bad conditions. It's dangerous. You've got the Colombian military looking for you all the time. I mean, you can see that guy there is sort of dressed half in military fatigues. That's quite common. And often they'll be dressed in rubber boots like Wellingtons just because of the conditions underfoot. Yeah, around eight. They've done their research. I was in prison again with a guy from the Sinaloa cartel, a pilot. He used to fly Cessnas just like this. He told me stories about literally coming down jungle, you know, airstrips like this, dirt, in a Cessna with a ton and a half, two tons of cocaine in the back. Get another load of powder. Take it back to the States with a quick stop to refuel in Panama under the protection of my old friend, Colonel Noriega. They were paying off Noriega. It's been proven that he was involved in drug trafficking. I mean, you imagine the amount of money involved in, in all this trafficking that's washing around. There's so much corruption. They will try and pay people like Noriega. I had to get some help. I called these boys my snowbirds. They were using multiple planes, so they would probably uh, limit the amount of times they used a certain plane in a month or, or however frequently in order to try and avoid detection. I mean, certainly in America, they, they would have records, you know, flight plans and stuff like that. We did things like that when we were using passengers, for example, we wouldn't use them any more than one or two times in a month. I know people that have done this into Britain using light aircraft coming from Holland. Predestined drops zone. You just drop it and you have people waiting in that area to, to collect. Or you have like a private runway and if you unload it quick enough, you make sure that you're, you've got the place secured and there's no police. Just uh, fire it out of the plane as quick as you can and get out of there. It is quite high risk. I mean, that's still happening for sure, particularly in in Central America and South America. Maybe not into America these days because the, the security is that good. Seven. So uh, this is making the capsules in order to swallow. Uh, I've seen them made like this. So this is a, a, a press to just compress the cocaine in order to make the capsule. In this instance, they're wrapping them in condoms, which is quite often how they're made. I would say a very high risk way of trafficking cocaine. And depending on the person's 
stomach, generally you're talking at about 800 grams to 1200 grams, so around a kilo that, you're, that they'll swallow. Quantas Ugh. Yeah, I never sent people this way. A, I didn't want somebody ending up dead on my on my account, and B, it was it was quite risky, well, highly risky. They all tell you that the capsules are 100 percent safe. There's no way they can split all sorts of stuff to get you to swallow them. Whereas in reality, is you know you stand a, a high chance of them bursting. When I was in Ecuador, it was in the news. A couple of people had swallowed capsules that had burst and they'd been found dead. Drug trafficking can be portrayed as being glamorous. A lot of it is not very glamorous at all. It's pretty gruesome trade. So, I mean, these are typical questions they, they, they would ask to see, you know, for example, have you bought your own ticket? Because if you haven't, if somebody else has bought it for you, then why? That's, that's, a, that's a big red flag. So she's just trying to catch her out here and see how much it costs and if she knows if she doesn't then obviously there's something wrong from us which is quite unlikely in Colombia is you know eight hundred dollars is a lot of money. ¿Usted tiene drogas dentro de su cuerpo? No. Yo quiero que usted me lo pruebe. Nosotros le queremos hacer una prueba de rayos X. The ways of proving it obviously is law enforcement will stop the passenger and uh, X ray them or nowadays we use the scanner as well. Uh, which is a much more detailed picture of what's going on inside. It's definitely a lot harder to use this method these days. Another thing they'll do is they'll put you in a room if they really think you've definitely got drugs in you and until you go to the toilet and uh, it, there's a collection pan. So anything that goes through there gets collated. But this is the sort of thing that happens. I got stopped on the first job that we did. Uh, I brought the tent back myself. Uh, which contained five kilos of cocaine impregnated in rubber. I was over the luggage allowance, so I had to give loads of stuff away in the airport, but kept a hold of this great big 10 run tent. Got stopped in Amsterdam at Schiphol Airport, questioned and released and let through, carrying five kilos of cocaine. I'd give that seven or eight, how much she was swallowing, the kind of questioning they, they undertook. I've gone into schools and just spoken about what happened to me and how I became involved in it and how bad it was in order to try and prevent them from becoming involved themselves. Tunnels have been documented. It's a known method that they've used in the past. They just want to get it out and get it dispersed. I mean, that's the most dangerous point when it's coming into the country. So they just want to get it out of that area and somewhere safe to the safe house as quick as possible, really. <laughs> Chapa Guzman was the head of the Sinaloa cartel. He's a real person. He's in prison in America somewhere for life. And these guys do oversee things. The amount of trust in people that you need to be shipping tons of cocaine around the world. That's one thing in films that's not quite true, is this idea of the, the super criminal, they're just on a phone and a laptop and everything happens and all these people working for them and they never go near anything, ever. Yeah, I'd give this seven out of 10. Seems really risk. Eric, she's a stewardess. They don't check her bags. Kevin. They've found a weakness in a system. They've found an air hostess who is up for carrying drugs. This does happen. Uh, when I was in prison in Ecuador, they, they arrested a captain of an airline. On several occasions, there were people involved with the airlines that had been arrested. This is back in the day, isn't it? I've met old school drug traffickers where it was you literally put drugs in a suitcase and get on a plane and traffic them because of, you know, the border controls were so lax back then. But these days, in particularly after 9-11, the border controls and the security uh, around airlines is so high. Getting drugs through passenger aircraft is very difficult, fairly realistic. Uh, I'd say seven or eight. That's just to identify uh, which containers have the drugs in. So they're using a UV stamp, which is obviously not visible to the naked eye, but as soon as you put a, a UV light on it, they're gonna know which containers can have the drugs in. Putting UV stamps on containers is one way of identifying where the drugs are.
normally in any drug traffic, a serious drug trafficking operation, you're going to have uh, front businesses to facilitate the movement of the drugs or the inflow of the drugs or the outflow or the, the laundering of money as well. Companies are, are, are quite often vital to uh, drug trafficking networks for numerous reasons. Uh, I'd give that probably a five. Just the amount of people involved and the scale. Drive to San Diego. So yeah, this is quite a common method of moving drugs around. Putting drugs into a, a caleta or a hiding place in the vehicle, which they will have manufactured or made. Certain vehicles have particularly good hiding places, voids and spaces that can be utilized as hiding spots. <laughs> I mean, the British police have got these. It's a mirror on a handle, so they're looking underneath the car to see if there's any new welding spots, anything obvious or anything that's out of place that might show a hiding spot. Obviously, they've got a sniffer dog there. I mean, if you're that far in the queue, I mean, you can't really run away from it then, can you? Because as soon as you get out of the vehicle, they're going to spot you and apprehend you. This is the first one she's done, but I mean, they would probably be using people that they'd already used before anyway, that they knew were trustworthy and solid. When we were sending people, we, you know, the reason I did that first one myself was because I didn't want to send people to do something that I had. So I'd be, I would be able to know what to tell them to expect quite often I would go, I'd be in the background somewhere just to, to make sure they're all right. This is quite realistic. To give that probably six because it's fairly realistic. I myself have become kind of a little bit bored of watching films about drug trafficking, having lived it. I mean, I've witnessed um, so many people getting killed in the most horrific means and ways that you can imagine, all because of, uh, you know, the money that's involved. So, I mean, if you do think it's glamorous, then I don't know what life you're living, but it's not the one that I live, that's for sure. Hello, my name is John Panisi. I'm a former maid member of the Lucchese crime family. I also got involved as a, a low associate uh, to the Gambino family when I was very young. Today, we're going to be looking at mafia scenes in movies and TV. He said I want the whole way over. <laughs> And what's depicted here is a guy getting what we would call straightened out, inducted. And it's inaccurate by the way that they're kidding around. This is a serious ceremony where there's no joking or playing around. Okay. That's St. Peter, my family saint. Now, was that card burned, so may your soul burn in hell if you betray your friends and the family. There was two members being made, and that is not accurate, it would be one at a time. They would bring one person up into the room and do the ceremony and then call the other one up. Some of the things were accurate that was said and obviously the pricking of the finger and the burning of the saint, but all in all, it, it wasn't 100%. I don't know if they put it there for this reason, but a lot of Italians are superstitious about birds. They don't even give cards out uh, with birds on it. They don't think it's a good sign. But doing really good this year with the sportsman. Yeah, it's been good. I'm gonna give it to you, my boy. It's yours. Nothing set in stone of how, how long you have to go as an associate before you become an inducted member. Well, some people have been associates for 10, 15 years. Five years, 10 years, three years. When I first got straightened out, it was the, at that time, the highest honor to be inducted into a family and to become a wise guy and to be treated with that respect. Looking back on it now, it was the lowest point of my life. It was an embarrassment because basically everything that I thought the life was about was a farce. From a scale from one to ten, I'd rate it a three. Listen to me, Michael. Michael, friends, why shouldn't you get a forty? Passing around jewelry, and that's insane. I don't even. I couldn't even answer what that is about and why they would put something like that. We want to do business with you, Michael. That's right. We've been together too many. We can wash our money. This was a commission meeting with the heads of families. New York is chopped up by the five families and everybody knows their place and they know who's who. The commission would meet if there was business to discuss within the families and decisions to be made. 
only the people involved in the meeting would obviously be in the know of where and when and what time they were meeting. They could take a, an underboss, a consigliere, or, or even a captain if they want. The different families intermingle a lot more than people understand, and it's not so territorial as people think. If they were attempting to hit somebody, it would definitely not be that flashy. It was very Hollywood to me with the helicopter and the machine guns. This would never happen. It would be very low-key and be done quietly. On a scale of one to 10, I would rate this a zero. We're gonna try you out with a little delivery job. It's for a uh, private lottery that we run. The mob is always testing you. They may give you something to do or an assignment and they wanna see how well you do and carry it out. That would be to just see how you perform overall and that you stand up and that you do what you're told to do. There was a saying in, in the mob that there was no rule book given out and you had to pick these things up yourself growing up and being around the life. Gotcha. What seems to be the problem, officers? Was I speeding? We'll decide what you were doing after an illegal search. In that life, you should always assume that you're being watched and followed and surveilled. That's the FBI's job. The FBI is out there doing their job, trying to make cases. So you should always assume that they are out there watching you. Some people may call it paranoia. I call it self-preservation. First and foremost, you shouldn't talk on the phone any, at any time. And you should just watch who you talk to, be very careful who you're speaking to and what you're speaking about. Most things are done and should be done in person. And you should also be leery of new people that you're meeting. I'd rather plan some felonies. Oh, then we should meet at our mafia crime headquarters. I think years ago they used to have storefronts and then the back would be a club or a place where they would gather, more, more, more so then than now. Meetings today would take place in a restaurant, in our case it was a cigar lounge, or at someone's house, or even outside. I beg you, I can't make this week's loan payment. Look into your hard drive and open your mercy file. File not found. Loan sharking is a big part of the income of the mob. Money would be lent to anyone. It, you know, people in desperate need of money, businessmen, anyone. Oh, this guy's an ox. He's got oxen-like strength. Hey, he needs a nickname, right? Let's call him Clamps. I myself didn't have a nickname. There's names like Johnny Sideburns that I speak about a lot. Uh, guys have names like Sammy Meatball, Sammy Clams, and it depends. Sometimes it's an attribute to you. I'm gonna rate it based on the future. <laughs> I'll give it a one. I remember seeing The Godfather when I was younger. I was very young and not in the, not in the life. I think that a lot of young guys who watch The Godfather all wanted to be gangsters after watching it. It's a little over the top, but I think it depicts a time in the mob when they had power like that to send a message. There were some forms of intimidation verbally that people would give out or send a message. At times, people could get a beating from the mob or get their windows broken or something, some kind of sign to tell the person, you know, that they're not happy about something. Being that it's the Godfather, I'll rate this at a seven. Our mole with the Russians tells things a little different. That's a f lie! If you're being questioned about something, they already know you're guilty of it. As far as punishment goes, it could go from someone getting a tongue lashing to them losing their life. People in that life always make a lot of mistakes, so there's always something that you hear of. Someone's always in trouble. Most of the time, you would hear something internally, but sometimes you would hear about somebody that made a mistake in another family. Now, my son is waiting out there in the car to go to the movies and I ain't gonna disappoint him. So most of us would try to keep our personal lives personal away from that life that we lived. I believe most families assume what the person is doing with their life, but it shouldn't be talked about with your family. Some family members are definitely completely in the dark about what their either husband or father or brother or son are doing.
as this whole thing unfolded from the beginning to where I am today, had a big effect on my family. I don't get to see them as often as I like to. They have to go through it with me, and it's, it's unfortunate. And they suffer too. On a scale of one to 10, I would rate this another zero. <laughs> he says, I must be dreaming. <laughs> Travolta tried his best to play John Gotti. I don't think that really anyone can play him. Although the makeup artist had him look like John Gotti a little bit. He tried to get the New York accent right, but it wasn't 100%. John Gotti was a capo regine, which is a captain in the family during this time. I had gotten to meet him twice with his son John Jr., once in Regines in Manhattan, second time at a club that they had in Ozone Park. My job now is to maintain continuity of leadership. So, I nominate John Gotti. So this scene was depicted obviously after Paul Castellano gets killed and the family has to put in place a new, a new boss. This scene would depict probably part of the administration and captains in the family. The administration being boss under boss consigliere. Obviously, in this scene, the boss is no longer alive. I believe it to be pretty accurate. I think that they would nominate, as they did John Gotti, and they would not necessarily take a vote, but no one would, no one would oppose it. I second the motion. So after he's voted in as boss of the Gambino family, it just goes to show you that you don't have to have the last name. That name came from Carlo Gambino, and it was passed down to Paul Castellano, and then taken over by John Gotti. Paul Castellano was put in a position because he was related to Carlo Gambino, but he was a businessman. John Gotti took the position from being a gangster, street guy two different kinds of bosses. I think as a good boss, you need brains and brawn. So you need to be smart business-wise, and you need to be a gangster, a tough guy in the street. I would rate this scene an eight. Will you? Right, let's play cards. Not a lot of money. Let's play cards. You guys like to play cards. Card games that I've seen was in cafes and things like that. Not like that. I got your message, Johnny. From here on, nothing goes down unless I'm involved. No blackjack, no dope deals, no nothing. A nickel bag gets sold in the park. I want in. If, if the mob was going to deal with a drug dealer, a known drug dealer, it would more be on the sneak and, and very low-key and quiet. It wouldn't be coming into social clubs like that. It would have to be done on a sneak because there is a rule that there's no drug dealing in their life. So that's a rule that's often broken. The other rule that you're not to go with a maid member's wife or girl is broke all the time. You think you're gonna live long enough to spend that money, you hump? I think the violence all the way up till the 90s was at a high as compared to today, and that's because of the cameras and cell phones and technology, so the violence has been more low key. I would rate this a two. You will be hearing from me, Mr. Scott. Okay, well. I can be very, very persistent. Do your worst. <laughs> Most likely the guy that was selling insurance was just trying to portray himself as a street guy. He definitely wasn't what we would call a friend in the street selling insurance. All mobsters have a front. Sometimes it's selling insurance. Sometimes it's waste management or sanitation. For the record, not all Italian Americans are in the mafia. The legitimate businesses that they get into varies, and it's really what fits that person. They get involved in a lot of legitimate businesses. It is a front, and it's to kind of throw law enforcement off too as to where they're getting their money from. I would say 90% of the people in the life are Italian, and then you would have probably 10% who are non-Italians and they're just associates. I would rate this scene as a five. I wanna go to college. I can't get called like this. Look, you take the speakers, right? At the same time, you say to yourself, this is the last time I'm ever gonna steal something. It's that simple. It's a low level uh, thing that he's involved in, but he would 
gradually graduate to more sophisticated crimes. You start hanging around with people who bring you around someone that's involved, usually on the outskirts, and eventually you'll become an associate if they want you to. But for the most part, it's, it's being young and easily influenced by these older guys. That's what drew me to the life. Being part of this group of well-respected men, that is the law of getting involved in that life. You don't pick that life. I always say that life picks you. I would give this scene a five. A young guy just don't wake up one day and say, hey, I'm gonna join the mob. By circumstance, you may know somebody who knows somebody, and that's usually the way it goes. As a young man growing up in both Ozone Park and Howard Beach, Queens, the mob was always around, and I kind of got involved as a, a low associate uh, to the Gambino family when I was very young. But by the age of 19, I wind up getting myself in a lot of trouble. I did 17 years in prison. I kind of stood away from the street for various reasons for about five years and then was pulled back into the street. And I wind up becoming uh, affiliated to the Lucchese family at that point. And I became a Lucchese associate and I went on to become an inducted member inside of a year. I was inducted into the life in 2013 and I left in 2018. So I was falsely accused of cooperating on a case that just happened within our family. And I know there's no such thing as walking away from the mob, but I basically just wanted to just try to live my life in peace. They would not stop hunting me down, sending people to come after me. And that was the deciding factor in my going to the government and cooperating with the government. Here is a list of every known member in organized crime according to the FBI, that you cannot talk to, meet, associate with, come in contact with. This character is obviously out on parole or on paper, as we say, and his lawyer is advising him of his stipulations that he has to follow. And some of those stipulations are not associating with anyone known in organized crime, anyone with a, with a, convic with a conviction. I mean, guys that want to be in their life today, they get locked up and arrested within three years. Ten guys get pinched. Nine guys want to cooperate. It's a race to the government's doorstep. When a pinch comes down, which means an arrest, ten guys get pinched, nine guys flip. That may be a little high, but it's, it's pretty accurate that a lot of guys turn quickly. They, they want to avoid going to jail. The movie and TV depicts mafia members as being honorable, loyal, and respectful. And it's a myth. There is no loyalty, there is no honor, there's none of that. In today's times, all that has been replaced by selfishness and greed. And people have a misconception of really what it's about. I would give this scene a 10. Hi, I'm Kane Vincent Dyer. Over a period of two and a half years, I did approximately over 100 bank robberies. Today, I'm back to look at more bank robbery scenes and some great movies. It is absolutely on point. Truck robberies are quite common. I think there was just one in Los Angeles a week ago. They said they had taken like 30,000. I think after review, it came down to 15,000. That's actually considerably small for hitting an armored car. The reason for that, that's where the banks get the money from. Any units in the air get 1061 in progress? I actually use police scanners in a lot of, of my bank heists. I would tap in to the police activity within an area, knowing when they're coming, knowing how much time you have left inside. So yes, it's absolutely something that a gang of that caliber would have. Let's go, let's go! We also see that they switched cars after the robbery, which is very, very, very common. All the cars that they're using are stolen, more than likely, right? Instead of stealing a car, what I would do is I would find that make and model of the car that I had and I would steal the license plate off an identical car. There are a lot of guys and crews that are out there that are like that. You have to give the town a 10. 
can I do you for, officer? Uh, why are you closed? We're gonna leave one by one. Nobody raise their head. Do not get up. I've gone into banks yelling, you know, to, to take control. When I actually talk to bank employees one-on-one -on -one, when I'm instructing them to do something, it's in a very soft tone, that ability uh, to adapt to a situation. And you see the difference between when he's in the bank talking to the customers and then when he switches his uh, personality to deal with the police officer. Wow. Pig's not working, Danny. I told you this thing's a pig. The car not working in that scene. You like to think that you'd have a perfectly operational vehicle when you go do a bank robbery. But hey, things happen sometimes. I actually think that is where you have a lot of bank robbers leave the car going or they'll park right in front. There's less effort in getting in and starting up the car. They can just get in and go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Move, 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 move. Get outside now. Hold time. What? we see that there are undercover police officers outside casing the bank also and waiting. Years later, when I turned myself in, I was told that they would actually do that. So the special FBI agent who was attached to my case, he would put teams together and they would go sit in front of banks and case banks looking for me to see if I was either casing a bank or robbing a bank. And it was all guessing work for them because I, I wouldn't leave too much of a roadmap for them. But it is something that absolutely happens when they have bigger gangs that are doing multiple robberies or multiple robberies have happened within an area in a short time. There's a lot of special effects in there and things like that, but it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. I'd give it an eight. Get your hands up! What's the matter with you? Back away, keep your hands where I can see you! In so many bank robberies, we actually witness the robbers coming in and yelling at customers and tellers alike to get down or to raise their hands. That's something that I definitely stayed away from. The thought process behind doing that is to have absolute control of the movement. I never asked anyone to lay on the floor or lift their hands. If you're a customer walking up to the bank and you see a bunch of people standing in there with their hands up or laying on the ground, you're not gonna enter. First thing you're gonna do is call the police. Hello, 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 ladies on, and gentlemen. We are the ex-presidents. We see the bank robbery crew wearing the president's mask, the, the rubber mask. One of the bad things about wearing a mask you're alerting people that probably something's going to take place here. I would wear glasses and a baseball hat because I wanted more so the element of surprise and to make certain that no one saw me walking up to the bank ready to, to commit a robbery. Time, Mr. Carter! 60! Let's go, let's go, let's go! In and out in 90 seconds. To be in and out in a minute and a half, pretty much right on the money. Typically, once you go into a bank and the, the alarm is set, depending on where law enforcement is in relation to the bank, it'll typically take about a minute and a half. You have a group of guys that are all going after the drawers. And depending on the location of the bank, they're probably not leaving with a big dollar amount. But I think their thing is quantity, do a lot of these things get in, get out, versus uh, spending too much time trying to take on the vault. But for the most part, whenever you have a group style bank robbery, it seems to be the method that they prefer, the overwhelming, the yelling, and things like that. So, point break, gotta give it a 10. I don't know any of those petitions that exist, but I've definitely seen preventative devices like that. A lot of the bulletproof windows, there's this double doors that was created. Well, the way it's set up now in a lot of banks that have been robbed a lot is once you go through that first door on the way out, they have a mechanism that can lock the door to outside where you actually get stuck in the middle there. Me personally, I never 
put my hands on anyone. I just always felt like uh, the minute you start assaulting people, you really add a whole nother layer of fear, which just completely can shut someone down. The biggest regret that I actually have is, you know, though I never physically harmed someone in any of the banks I did, you know, there's still a psychological toll that, uh, of trauma that people absolutely can take on that I didn't account for. So for me, part of my penance wasn't just turning myself in and, and doing a prison sentence voluntarily. It was also immersing myself in victim impact, which I've done over the years, over the last 10 years. Worked with a lot of victims of violent crime. Come on, what about him? Come on, let's go, what about him? I have definitely aborted several bank robbery attempts. One was purely instinct. And sure enough, within two minutes of me sitting there, an unmarked Fed car pulled out, two federal agents got out. Another time is I did have an individual aggress towards me. And since I did know that the only way around this was gonna be through a confrontation, I aborted immediately. There was just some inconsistencies there. So I'm gonna give it a four. We see them going into the bank during a rainstorm. And to be quite honest, those were my favorite times to do a bank robbery. Why? Because you don't stand out when you have on a big jacket. You don't stand out if you have a hood over your head. And there's less people paying attention to things. I used to believe that taking everybody's cell phone and things like that was kind of a waste of time just because it would add a significant layer of timing for me. By the time they make the call, you should be in and out already. And just uh, disguising yourself properly so they weren't capturing images of you. Take a deep breath and relax. We're here to rob the bank, not you. We do hear him telling the customers, hey, this is the bank's money, not your money. I, I absolutely thought robbing banks was a victimless crime because I was stealing the institution's money, not a mom and pop or a store or an individual. Unfortunately, it's not correct thinking just because of what I've mentioned in the past because you, you don't include someone's trauma. I personally never attempted to knock out a security system solely because what I was doing was hitting a vault and getting out really quick, right? In and out. With that said, I have done interview views on groups that have absolutely uh, severed security systems, built tunnels uh, up under the bank, the guys that do those things are typically going for banks that have multi-millions of dollars. I can absolutely see a crew going about it this way, even making some of the mistakes that they're making. I'm gonna give it about a seven. All right, give me your gun then. Everybody sit down, everybody sit down on the floor. Deciding to hit a bank with or without a security guard is interesting to me. A lot of security guards are also trained not to react aggressively. Most security guards are there as a deterrent, as a visual deterrent, and others are there simply to be a professional witness versus stopping a bank robbery. Ladies behind the counter, keep your hands visible, not on the alarms, okay? We see him tell the uh, bank employees not to sound the uh, silent alarm. It actually differs with different banks and different branches. But for the most part, those devices are usually reserved for head tellers, managers, assistant managers, maybe if someone in an administrative role at a desk, they will hit the silent alarm when they notice you are almost on your way out versus creating a hostage situation. So it makes sense. Open the gate. I don't, I don't have a key. What'd you say? Each time I've instructed a bank manager or a, a head teller to take me into the vault, 
they usually comply. I always try to take my tone down. What I was able to experience early on, the more you're yelling at a person, the more you're kind of flustering them. When they're under a certain amount of pressure, they break. Was he hiding the key intentionally or did he just forget? It's hard to say. It's hard to say if they're just flustered. I give it around a six. Maxton and I will take the vaults because we know how to use the tools. You two are on crowd control. Make it clear you're in charge or things could get messy. In this clip, we get to see them doing a little planning of what they're gonna be doing within this bank robbery. I would go over every entry route, every exit. I, I made it my job to know all the different routes that would get me back to my safe area. The robot's done with the vault. I'd always wanna be in and out of the vault in three minutes, give or take. In a situation where you have a group bank heist or bank robbery, it would probably be a lot easier to make entry into a vault as long as it was open and they knew what they were doing. But if you're a lone robber, like I was, it can be quite risky, but it is a method that I used. Peralta, cops. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, oh no, what a bummer, the police. There was a situation back in 97 where two off-duty officers working in a Los Angeles bank, not in a uniform, just posing as a customer within the bank actually confronted uh, two bank robbery suspects, which ended up in one of the suspects dying. But a lot of banks won't hire armed security solely for that matter, because they know that another person inside the bank with a firearm is just more of a chance of engagement. Don't be mad at me, Brooklyn fans out there. I'm gonna give them a two. Speed. The first thing people would think, well, why are you speeding off? That is just absolute adrenaline. Once a guy told him to slow down, they rolled down both windows. That is something that I actually intentionally did. Typically, you would assume someone trying to get away from something, they'd be trying to be as much incognito as possible. That's it, come on. Ah, ah, ah. No bundles, just loose cash. One of the bank robbers, demanding only loose cash, no bundles. There's this belief amongst bank robbers that so much of the money that come in bundles either have die packs that will explode once you get a certain feet away from the bank or they'll have tracers in them, which is true. Um, I've, come, I've come across a tracer before. If it's a bundle, typically be right in the middle. They believe that grabbing just loose Currency would prevent them from coming across a die pack or a tracer. Pretty smart, but it does limit the money you get. This gun? Yeah. Keep up with the circumstances, okay? Yeah, I got it. So are y'all gonna steal my gun too? In this scene, we see that the customer has a firearm. That is a huge concern uh, amongst bank robbers. Well, uh, at least it was for me, which is one of the reasons why before I went into the bank, I absolutely would do my homework. I would monitor citizens coming in and out of the bank, how they walked, if they seemed aggressive, if they seemed like they just go more with the program. And it's safe to say, that's why I probably only had one guy come at me within all of those robberies. Fortunately, they didn't have a weapon. It's very real with the exception of them letting the guy keep the gun, just sitting the gun on the counter. Maybe we should hit that bridge, Jay. No, we ain't. We hit those banks first thing in the morning. They robbed two banks in the same morning. I'm guilty of that. I knew one bank probably carried a certain amount during that morning, and there was another bank that was in the area. They did it for a different reason. It was clear their first robbery, they didn't get a lot, so their desperation drove them to do a second one within the same day. That was very real. We'll give it an eight. Finally, something good. Oh, nice. Most people, whenever you've seen someone trying to rob an ATM, they usually have a chain around it 
attached to a truck and them trying to pull it out of some place. Other thing, as you can see, it's, it's very difficult getting into those things. I personally have never thought about robbing an ATM, but they do hold a lot of currency. So I could see why it would be tempting. Spider-Man is fighting the Avengers in a bank on 21st Street. Typically, if a bank has a lot of glass, once it gets dark, it's easy to see inside of those banks. All that glass, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna prevent people from actually seeing in due to the glass reflection. Marvel fans, DC fans, please do not send me hate mail for rating this a one. My favorite bank robbery scene in the movies that we watch today, definitely the town. The town is just on it. I, I don't think you get any more real than, than what these guys did here. He has on this helmet, so he doesn't need a mask. He doesn't look like he'd be coming in to rob necessarily. It looks like he just kept his helmet on, which guys do all the time. I can really, really relate to this. Him wearing that backpack, I would sometimes either wear a backpack or a duffel bag strapped around the front and you can still have the control of your hands. That's the only drawback. If you get any kind of tracker or die pack, you walk off and that die pack explodes, he's wearing it on his chest. This is so real. It typically happens your first time or two. Bank robbery is bad enough, so just to put that out there. And what we know from watching the movie is he's in a really desperate situation. Sometimes the desperation kind of overrides the moral compass. It's very accurate. It takes a second for him to pump himself up. Yeah, get up. He has tape. He doesn't want those gloves coming off, you know? So obviously he's really conscious of not leaving any type of fingerprints. Also, it's holding his sleeve to the jacket down which could be covering up some type of uh, tattoo. Interesting that he picked a bank with glass. Because of the glass, he's got to throw it over to them. And, you know, they could put any kind of device in that bag. It, it, it almost shows most, more so the desperation that he went into this bank that is secure with glass and everything like that, but he was still so desperate that it, it didn't stop him. Him having a problem with his motorcycle is something that's sure it's happened. They just blow through that red light with all those cars coming. I don't think a, a intelligent police officer would do that just because you're putting a lot more people at risk. I would actually rate this a nine. Going into the bank, leading up to the bank, preparing, getting nervous everything he did, even the mistakes he made inside were actual mistakes that if you, you know, you haven't done it, you would probably make. This vault that looks like no one could ever get in except for probably the US military. We have to keep in mind that this movie, everything about this movie is supposed to be over the top. Yes, they do have very intricate, lock safes and things like that, time lock safes, things that are really hard to get into. But a lot of time during business hours, they will keep certain safes open just so the employees can have access. I learned everything. So every bank I went into, I knew whether it was gonna have a safe such as the one that's in this scene or if it was going to be a regular open door. And if it were like this, I would pass. <laughs> Unless I found in one of their manuals or knew that they would keep this door open between certain times. Could I get into that back then where things were more manual? Oh yeah, I, I mean, it, it would have taken a considerable amount of time to break into that. That's not like a three or four minute deal. You wouldn't have an, uh, a weapon in there like that unless you had a security guard that was armed. You got to keep in mind, if you shoot that shotgun and he hits that bank robbery suspect, those rounds are probably exiting the perpetrator and going straight into the bank customer or the bank employee. What bus driver? 
that school bus doesn't have any damage on it and he just crashed through <laughs> uh, a cement and stone building. And if you remember, it had to go up the steps because when they robbed the building, they went up the steps. So that, like, totally Hollywood, right? Definitely a one. <laughs> The camera's already got them in, uh, you know, on video. So why even use a mask at that point? Either they should have gotten out of the car, gone straight in with the mask on, or um, not used anything. Stay down. We want to hurt no one. The energy is so on point. How they talk, how they walk, how they move. Uh, even the customers, just the fear that's there. Silophane money, the money's still wrapped. This is how a lot of banks will keep the money when it comes in because they're still coming from, you know, basically the factory. Now, Far East National Bank 1130. The silent alarm is actually going off as they're leaving, which is what employees are actually trained to do it's less chance of the cops getting there and them having a hostage situation. The police are being alerted as the bank robbers are leaving, which is super accurate. I would actually give it about a seven. The energy is so accurate for the bank robbers, for that team. You can feel the desperation that it needs to get done. They know exactly what they're doing. You can tell by the way they move, where they go. They know the layout of this place. Bank robberies that are done by a lot of different gangs. This is how they go in and this is how they operate. Just with brute force and sheer fear. When's the time lock set for? Nine o'clock. Don't lie to us. It's 8.15. He asked her uh, something very specific about the bank, which he already knew. I would ask a bank employee a question just because I knew the answer and I wanted to see if they were going to be straight with me or not. I wanted to see if they were going to be nervous, how they were going to respond to the question I was asking. He just wanted to see if she was going to cooperate. Hold it. Silent alarm. This address. You pull the alarm? No. No. A lot of people believe that everyone in a bank, you know, all employees have silent alarms. That's not accurate. There's very specific people that have the silent alarms um, that are allowed to push it. Bleaching is something I haven't seen done before. I know why he's doing it, uh, to get rid of all type of evidence. You know, once you put bleach on anything, everything just kind of dissipates. It's just interesting to me that they're doing that. Like the gloves, they, they, they have them so much that covers them up. I would say this movie is a 10. For the realistic way that these guys are just that aggressive, unfortunately, you have a lot of guys that go in and that's how they do it. He's gonna kill us all. <laughs> Unless you can give me a giant lot of cash. I have a plan. I, I didn't start robbing banks just to, because I wanted money. I started robbing banks out of desperation in order to pay off a debt that a very dear relative to me had incurred to a criminal organization. When people do a solo robbery and they're trying not to be seen, this is exactly how they would approach it. They would hand the teller a note. They would probably smile at people in line. We can say he makes the mistake of showing his face, but most guys that go in solo like that, they often do that. And they, they hit these smaller banks and they just hope that the banks don't really link up and they won't get that much attention, but they will go in and show their actual faces. You know, someone's like, why is she moving that slow? She's probably still processing. What they are trying to do is try to give you money that has some kind of detector in it, some kind of tracer or die pack. And we see the stack. 
that stack looks a lot bigger. It looks like something he should take. It could be what they call the bait money. A stack that bank employees have put to the side and with those are the bait money, die packs, tracers. Here we see him being captured on video. So when I did all of my bank robberies, it was in the end of 99 going into 2000. And you didn't have cameras that were as high quality as they have now. So these old cameras used to be really grainy. So they would have a lot of them, but it's very common to have the cameras coming in. There are even things along doors that will allow a witness to gather even how tall you are. You'll see it in a lot of stores or banks. And when someone passes it, the employees are trained to look where he lines up on that. Absolutely a 10. Absolutely a 10. There's no hold on this one. But you see the man with the briefcase? Yes. That's my partner. He has a gun in there. If you don't do exactly what I tell you, or if you give me any kind of a problem at all, I'm going to look over at my partner, and he's going to shoot your Mr. Gwendon between the eyes. I have done that. I have gone into a bank and immediately given instructions. I've looked back at the door from which I came in and told an imaginary accomplice there to make sure everyone keeps their head down, not lay down or hands in the air, but they keep their head down, like the, just their eyes focused on the ground, and there was never anyone there. Take one of those big envelopes and put as many hundreds, fifties, and twenties as you can pack into it. He's disarming her fear, literally, yeah. So it's not bringing any attention to them. That method is a very, very common method. I would say things like that. Even if I yell louder at everyone else, I would tell the person that I was trying to get to, to do whatever I'm trying to get them to do. I would be much more calm with them versus screaming at them. The rating I'm going to give this picture is a 10. You know, you would think he wouldn't just go into a bank like that, but people will do things like that, especially if it's a smaller bank and they think that the news isn't going to travel. Available units, we have a bank 211 in progress at the Pico Rivera Savings. In that is super accurate where they're trying to back down other law enforcement. The FBI agent that was assigned to my case, Patrick Connolly, he changed how they went after bank robbers. And a lot of times they would just wait for bank robbers to get caught in the, you know, after the fact. And they get caught doing something else and someone tells on someone. We've been surveilling these guys for weeks. That's what surveillance is. They commit a crime and then we stop them. The police aren't working together. In my case, that happened a lot too because other officers weren't giving uh, Special Agent Patrick Conley the information he needed, or they just weren't used to chasing down actual bank robbers. Anytime he heard something come up, he was always there. Once that silent alarm was hit, he'd also go. I have never been in that situation where I have been inside and the cops have shown up, but I have been in the situation where as I'm driving away, all the cops are coming into it. The moment I saw all the cops, I rolled all the windows down, turned my music on and started singing. I'm, I'm gonna give it a seven because today, you know, I think law enforcement has, has learned a lot by not communicating with each other. This scene here is very high tech. <laughs> this isn't a normal bank robbery, right? There are guys in the military and um, certain groups around the world that can absolutely do this. Now, a typical bank robbery, you're working within a certain construct of time and trying to get in a vault like that, even if you have the skill set to get into it, it would probably take you as long to get in that vault as the sentence you would get for getting into it. I have gone into banks that have safe locks and uh, vaults and time lock vaults and stuff like that. But there is a bank in Spain 
that operates in this way where if certain parts of it are triggered, it will flood the actual safe, which holds all the gold. I'll give it a 10 for entertainment, but I'm going to give it a one on the skill set that anyone would have to go do that. I've been waiting to go into a bank and I've seen a pregnant lady or an elderly person go in and it's made me either pause or wait because I didn't want to, you know, like I said, a, a lot of people, when they do this, they, 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 they're not thinking that they're hurting the individual. They're just taking the money. You're putting a lot of psychological, a lot of psychological damage and trauma on someone. Uh, sometimes you don't realize that in the moment. Just the one, Sonny! Right. This happened in 1972 in Brooklyn. Just a horrible situation when you have this hostage situation. <laughs> right now, he's in serious, serious denial. I haven't been in this situation, but I remember even before I turned myself in, making the decision that I wanted to turn myself in, there was just so much back and forth with myself. They got me on kidnapping, armed robbery, they're gonna bury me, man. Attica! 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 Basically, he's buying time. We are working off survival instinct here now because he knows. He can't go anywhere, but now it's just about survival. I'm gonna give it a 10. And were there mistakes made in the bank? Absolutely. Were there things that a normal bank robber wouldn't do in the bank? Yes. But in this situation, all those mistakes played into him getting caught. A lot of bank robbers, especially their first time or something like that, out of desperation, they will just take whatever they can put in. And I've heard about bank robbers going inside and forgetting to take anything to collect the money, <laughs> you know, putting everything, trying to put everything in a t-shirt, you know. He wasn't prepared for that, which it gave him pause, but then he had to jump back into his, into that zone of getting them out of there. So I like that they kind of did that, where they give him this human quality, like, whoa, you know, I didn't expect that because he's just the driver. That's a situation that could definitely happen. The guy who's engaging them has on has a Marine Corps hat on and, and a Marine Corps decal on his car. And that was something that was always on my mind when going into a bank, you know, just wondering if there's going to be another guy in there like me. He was a Marine like myself. It happened to me where I had a guy who was probably former military or something engage me, come at me, tell me to stop. And I followed the command. I know it sounds weird, but I followed the command because it just wasn't worth physically harming someone for me. Just that scene there, that interaction, I would give it another seven. We saw a lot of violence happening and it's easy from the outside to say, okay, that wouldn't happen. But heck, that happened. I didn't know I was in a library. I've been into banks where during the day where you see working crews there, but I would think that this would be something where you'd have working crews like that at night. But if you had to have them during the day, I could see how that guy could be in there. Everybody get down on the floor now! I never used a team like that. Sometimes people will get a little violent, uh, unfortunately. And a lot of guys probably think that's the way to instill fear, to get people to do what you tell them. But kind of against that. Once again, we're looking at Hollywood. A bank would be much more secure than that. But a lot of old banks did just have the glass doors. Later on, in probably like the early 2000s, what happened is you started to see banks incorporate this double door 
mechanism. What that was actually for is to trap bank robbers inside those first doors that they went out of. I don't know if a bunch of serious trained guys were doing something like this. This is probably the way they would do it. So I will rate it another seven. Hi, my name is Oktav Duram, nickname Oki. I did more than 10,000 burglaries. I robbed everything you can imagine. My name is Arthur Brandt. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm an art detective. I'm responsible for recovering 250 million of stolen art. We now work together in trying to prevent art heists. We are going to look at diamond heists from Hollywood movies. If you do this in real life inside, everybody would, would have been dead, I guess. No, but look at the mechanism as well. I mean, it doesn't look like that. I did this a couple of times and they don't open like that, no way. You have a door and there is a, a lock on it, but with two keys, one from the bank to, from the bank employee and one from you, but it's one piece. So if you cut this one out, this one is still here. If, if you, have, you have to pull them both out and then lift them open. But the first time I did it, I had blisters this thick. The first time I did it, I couldn't use my hands. I uh, underestimated how much power I had to use to open it. And I opened a few hundred, so every time it, the screwdriver was going in my palm of my hand, my hands were this thick. It really hurt. It takes at least three, four minutes to open one. And the small ones are very tough. And the ones who were on top, because I can't put any pressure, if they were on this height, I can open them. But if they were this height, I couldn't, you know, put any strength on it or power. So I have a good tip, if you have a safety deposit in a bank, make sure it's small and it's on top. <laughs> but what do you find in it? Uh, everything. Diamonds, gold? Everything, everything. You find diamonds, gold, pearls, but you also find very uh, heavy pictures and stuff like that, that you can't really, you know, I'm not into that, but you, uh, what's called extortion. You could extort. Really, you see pictures, or you see uh, people who have a, a completely, uh, they have a double life. I took a bag, and it had, at that time, I'm talking about 25 years ago, it, has a, it had only videotapes, and at that time, uh, a videotape recorder with a little screen. So if you open it, you could see it. It's like a laptop. I think he was watching adult movies in the safe. You know, I, I, what, why is it in the safe? <laughs> Most of the time, they're in envelopes, small ones. It looks good in the movie, but I never found them like that. I found a lot of diamonds, in, official in books, you know, uh, what they are with the certificate next to it. I found books with, six diamonds each in it from, let's say, half a carat to one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three. And I found six of these books that were worth one and a half million Swiss francs at the time. Man, I love colored stones. Some diamonds with uh, some special color, color are very expensive, but most of the time, especially the yellow ones, are just off-color diamonds, you know? They're not worth that much. Most of the time they are cheaper unless they are flawless. Most of these gangs, they know people who can sell this stuff, you know? They can say, this is good, this is not, and they will sell it. If they make you do a job like this and they know you don't uh, know nothing about value, you get screwed, of course. They rip you the, off. That's the diamond business anyway, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, I don't want to rate it. No. It doesn't get a rate. This is a clip about one of the most famous heists ever in England. In 2015, a bunch of senior guys decided to rob a safety deposit store somewhere in Hatton Garden in London. They got away with diamonds and gold worth of hundreds of millions. Finally, they got caught, but still a big part of the loot is gone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There's someone at the front door. In this scene, the alarm goes off and the car doesn't uh, take action. This does happen. Just a few months ago, I was involved in cracking one of the biggest art heists ever in Europe. In 2012, a guy entered the National Gallery in Athens and stole a Picasso. He set off 
the alarm on purpose more than a hundred times. So every time the guard came looking, watching for, for an intruder, but he was standing behind uh, the curtains. So after a while, the guy thought there is some technical failure. So he stopped showing up. And at that moment, the guy had a few minutes to steal the Picasso. And don't forget, 95% in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands of the alarm uh, alarms are, uh, are fake. Yeah, when an alarm goes off, in so many cases, it's fake because there is a bird or a curtain. Yes. I don't like lookout because if you have a lookout, if, if you're inside, you're safe. So in the lookout is the one who's hot because if he walks around, people will be, what is this guy walking around? Can you imagine doing that? They've been in for what, 24 hours or longer, just one day. Eh? Yeah. If they were in longer, oof, it would have been big. But in this case, this guy who was on the lookout even fell asleep, you know. <laughs> yeah, but he's hot. You know, what are you doing here? It's common for amateurs. But the mistake in this uh, robbery is was they were texting they, each other with their own phones. They thought they were smart because there the, is no phone tap. But now everybody knows about this. Oh, you never call and this and that. You don't do that. But I would rate this movie a 10 because it shows how it went. Yeah, you know, this really is the, one of the biggest highs ever. It looks like it's worth maybe <laughs> 30, 40 million or something. I don't want to take it from the person. I can see something that the person is wearing and then figure out where he lives, but not ever touch anybody. But most of these chains don't even have a lock to open or close, you know? And if they have, they have uh, maybe a triple security. It doesn't go over a click one, it has to one, two, three, and then comes off. Most of these chains, they go over your head if they're with these kind of stones, you know? Why do you need a, a lock to open or close it? I think this one is very heavy. Yeah. It's possible to do this, you know? You have pickpocket people who can do this. They they take your watch off. You don't even notice them in chain. Diamond toilet. The private security, they will go in. Nobody will stop them because they have to be with their subject. She can't go out of sight. It's impossible that somebody will stop these two guys. In the Netherlands, they're not allowed to have private guards with guns, but outside the Netherlands, it's, it's allowed. Most of these security are ex-military, so they, have a, they know a lot about them, what they did before, if they're disciplined, you know, if they can keep their mouth shut, what they see or notice. Yeah, I don't even know why it's that coordinated with all kinds of people, you know, put a uh, chain into a soup and then it goes <laughs> to a kitchen and uh, if you have the chain, you run out. And I don't know how we have to get out. If somebody gets arrested, they don't find the stuff on him, on her, you know, they already passed it along. Otherwise, you're uh, a suspect, then you have to give it to somebody else. I I've been to uh, Monaco to check these kind of necklaces and it was possible, but I didn't know that half the city of Monaco are cops. I didn't know <laughs> it's the most secure place in the world. It's true. I, two cops on every person or something like that. Mm. You, you won't make it. I would say a five. I'll give it a four. Okay, here's the copy. All right. It's not hard to make a knockoff, you know, in pearls. With diamonds, it's a different thing. But with pearls, it's very easy. Oh, I have a 33 million euro gift from the gentleman over there, perhaps. And I don't care if he has an internet site and he has a lot of money out of whatever, or other auction houses. Somebody has to authorize who you are. Not a lot of people know this, but in 1911, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre. We have quite uh, a few similarities. I mean, he robbed the Louvre, I robbed the Van Gogh, so uh, only this is fiction, I'm real. You know, I didn't watch the Lupin series yet, because why should I, you know, the real Lupin sitting next to me, he can tell me the real story. And he had to figure out to become a person who cleans everything and, you know, it's too much. It's unrealistic. Also for... It's spectacular seeing this, but of course it doesn't happen this way. I never did this. No. no. You went down the roof and normally in a museum, the alarm goes off from the roof, you know. 
in real life you wouldn't do that because the I don't know what it is, uh, grease or something. If you go over the ground and it's come on your clothes, that grease will go everywhere. It will go in your getaway car. It will go in your house everywhere. That's why you wouldn't do that. He needs it just to go over the ground. I mean, why don't crawl, you know? Why uh, just a, a laser on the ground? Why not a, a sensor who takes the whole uh, room, you know, this? It's funny, but normally you go on your stomach and you crawl forward. I did that. Most of the time they are in a, a square case, you know, and it's inside. It's not that you can lift something up and the, the bottom stays there. He grabs the stone with uh, some sort of gadget. I can understand he has to work from the ground because some sort of laser or detector, but there is nothing harder than a diamond, you know. Okay, if you take a sledgehammer, you will break it, but if you drop this diamond, there's no problem. You know, it's, it's very hard. And you cannot scratch it, so don't worry. The Pink Panthers, they don't leave clues, but what they did, for example, they stole uh, the screen by Munch, like 20 years ago, and uh, a painting worth 150 million. So they left a note with a smiley and they said, uh, thank you for the bad uh, security. But it's very stupid when you do this, because uh, you have cops who, t when you do that, they take it personal and they will be after you forever. When you think it's over, there's still one going, oh, you wrote that letter, right? Wait. If you, they if don't you, like it. If you tease them, don't do they're going to take it personal. Because normally a professional won't take these diamonds. No, that, that's, a, that's the thing. You have, to, you have to cut these diamonds, you know. They are known. So you have to find someone who can cut them before you can sell them on, on the black market or on the legal market. But when you steal diamonds from a museum, all diamonds, especially when they are in, in some kind of jewelry, they are not really important diamonds. So you, can, you can't hardly cut them. So when people steal old diamonds, they probably didn't do their homework well. But it would be better if you would have shown in this clip uh, Inspector Clouseau, the clumsy inspector who is going to have to solve this case. Because, you know, when I track down a, a piece of stolen art, a Picasso or whatever, they call me the Indiana Jones of art in the media. But in reality, I'm more like Clouseau, you know, like this inspector. I follow the wrong suspects. I, they, they feed me with false leads. When I disguise myself, I look more ridiculous than Inspector Clouseau when he was uh, disguised as a pirate with an inflammable parrot on his shoulder. But we do have one thing in common, and that's that we never give up. And nobody takes him serious, but in the end, he cracks the case. I would rate this movie a 10. Four, five, you know, I mean, it's too Hollywood. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's the back. They got it right in this movie because normally in these Hollywood movies they go through the door, but nobody goes through the door. It's the most protected part. <laughs> this robbery has something to do with the case that I solved. That was the Ring of Oscar Wilde. It was stolen in 2002 in, in Oxford University. The thief got caught, but he told uh, police that he had melted the ring down. Nobody knew that he had sold the ring to somebody. And this guy had stored this same ring in one of these safety deposits in Hatton Garden. What I'm doing is profiling, you know? I'm thinking, what would I have done? Uh, when they saw, showed footage of the burglary, one of the uh, thieves had rainbow socks on, rainbow socks. And I said, you check that heist, because if it was young guys, they would destroy the ring or they would sell it or throw it away. But only older men have the respect for the real value of this ring. So it got stolen again in 2015. Of course, this guy couldn't go to the police and say, look, they have stolen my Oscar Wilde ring because it was stolen before. I heard rumors on the market that a certain ring had appeared on the market, appearing to be Oscar Wilde's ring. So Oki came to my home and he said, he did these heists and in many of these safes he found stolen art, you know, stolen jewelry. So he gave me the lead and then I approached these guys, these senior guys, and finally I tracked the ring back. 
They had sold it because they didn't know it was the Ring of Oscar Wilde. They sold it to a jewelry shop who had sold it to some guy. So it shows that stolen jewels do appear on the black market. In this case, even on the legal market. And the recovery rates for art theft um, are very small. I think that uh, around seven or eight percent is being recovered. The rest disappears forever. I'm, ju I'm just checking for wear on the pads. You can work out the code by identifying the most worn ones. I open doors like that. It's true, but then you have to know the combination. Because if you have four times four, I don't know how many combinations you have. Hundreds. There are different ways to open this door. You don't need a key. He has a, a piece of paper, I guess, uncut key. He pulls it in and when he flips it, he will see the cuts of the mechanism inside and then cuts it off and then it will turn. Well, let's give it a 10. A 10, because it really happened. And it, it's really what they do, it's, it's real. And this is the famous uh, nitrogen, very dangerous. It, it, if it fails like that on your, on your finger, you, you can, can break it off. I know a few very serious burglars, they never use this. Hey, Nick. Joey, talk to me. Tell me what you got. It's not here. But the distraction thing is, is an interesting one. Somebody is, is threatening to kill himself, so everybody is distracted. And this does happen, you know. The, the most famous uh, gang of art thieves in the world are the Pink Panthers. They are named after a Hollywood film. They come from Yugoslavia, and this gang has both male and female members. And they do use these tricks. In 2004, in the Louvre, there was an antiquities fair, and there was a diamond worth 60 million uh, Dollar, it was on display, bright lights, uh, security guards, but then the wife of the French minister arrived. So everybody looked for a second the other way, and when they looked back, the diamond was gone. In another case, they painted a bench in front of a jewelry shop in Miami that they were about to hit because they didn't want anybody to sit there and become a witness of what they do. They use pretty women to distract guards and all stuff like that. So this does happen. If you Cut a wrong, a wrong mechanism inside. The whole door locks. You don't want to open it. You, you won't open it again, you know? Yeah, also a four or a three, you know? I mean, you get caught if you do it like that. I know of one museum who has lasers. It's the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, but I don't think it's like this, you know? You can't dance around these lasers. I'm like, what is this capoeira stuff? Are you nuts? This is, this does not exist. Even if it would exist like this, not touching any one of these lasers is impossible. It's impossible. Even if you would have seen them, if you would see them, you know, without using any spray or something, it's impossible to do this. To practice to do this little dance, it will take you about a year. The whole collection is gone. Uh, you, what you see now is gone in the air and you'll be dancing still with your lasers. I never uh, studied the alarm for a long time. I mean, when you see a building, you see how I'm gonna get in and I see the system and uh, it will be, yeah, uh, studied in a minute. It's a system that I can do, I can hack or not. There must have been a lot of sensors, right? I think at least uh, 20 or something is always one or two or three, two in a corner, they take the whole area. I really doubt if, if technology will ever be that perfect uh, to prevent art thefts from happening. Because, you know, there is always a button you can switch off. And even if they can't find a button, you know, they come in with a gun. The average burglar would, do, would not do this because he doesn't have a skills or uh, the balls to do it. Because it looks very uh, scary. They're scared of jail. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. I did crimes, I can do the time. I did a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I give this movie um, a 10, no kidding, a zero. Freshness gallery. Clothes for cleaning. Cleaning? Yeah. Doing it right now. You never talk to a guard, otherwise you can remember your face. You always uh, avoid to see a guard. Upstairs sent us down to clear this exhibit. These are the fake guards. It's impossible to 
be in a museum. And, and to me, this guy is uh, too heavily guarded. He has like a taser and uh, it's impossible. In, in, the, in the Netherlands, it's not even allowed. I've never seen these uh, these big cats. Probably they exist somewhere, maybe in the Louvre. When it happens, when the alarm goes off, it goes down, and they use something like it could be like that. But in a museum, it doesn't go down. M most of the time, if they have uh, walls like that, it goes down uh, when they when they are closed and they connect them to the ground or to the wall. They don't open up anymore, but it doesn't come all of a sudden when a uh, Alarm goes off because a painting comes off the wall. Oh my God, you know, you can make this up. Well, apparently you can. He takes an oil painting and he folds it in two. Can you imagine? The painting is, is nailed on a wooden stretcher, so it breaks. The frame, most of the time, together is with some, uh, what's called, plexiglass, you know? So you won't get it out because it's connected to each other. We really have to take some time to, to disconnect it from each other. Heist, especially art heist, are normally done by, by a gentleman thief, but the reality is different. Normally these heists are linked to organized crime. I have to deal with mobsters, with narcos, with terrorists. To give you one example, the, the second most searched painting, on, second on the FBI most wanted list, is the Caravaggio. It was stolen in 1969 in Palermo, Sicily. And it's said that it's, it's, it's being displayed at meeting between mafia bosses. So that's the kind of people we have to deal with. Most of the time when it comes to burglaries, it's a human error because you must imagine if you're in a museum, nothing ever happens. So if something happens, everybody panics and they don't know, they forgot the rules. They get uh, mixed up. A rate? A rate? A tree. Gee, two, that's, or that's a two. generous. Yeah, a two. Every transaction meticulously recorded for posterity in the family ledger. You see two paintings that were stolen, but they were not uh, in the movie. They were at my uh, friend's house. You see the two paintings that made Octave famous, the, the two Van Goghs that he stole in 2002, but in reality they were not there on, this, on their couch, but it was under his bed. He sold it to a, a, a mafia boss in Italy who later used these paintings to get a lesser sentence. So luckily they came back uh, in one piece. And you have, and a few, some of the times you have people who steal it and they figure out that they can't sell it and they panic, right? And they, they destroy it. When this happened in the city, the blacklist, my uh, telephone crashed. I was after him and now that he has stopped doing these things, we are working together trying to get these things prevented from happening, you know? Arthur has his contacts. He's got some information. He doesn't tell me everything. I go out on the streets, talk to my people. They don't talk to him. And in the middle, we figure things that other people can solve. This is your chance to solve a century and a half's worth of abductions and thefts. So for me, it was something that uh, I can make some money. I never knew that people uh, got hurt if paintings are stolen. Uh, I didn't understand at the time. I do right now understand that people get hurt uh, if paintings are stolen. And that's one of the reasons I get some paintings back now. That's 10 enough. out of 10. Tell me about this one. Also from Benin, 7th century. <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda. She's like the director of the museum. Yeah, nobody approaches, mm -hmm. uh, the director doesn't approach or anyone, a guy. Art stolen from Africa is a hot item these days. Um, countries from Africa are demanding these pieces back from Western museums because they were stolen during colonial era. And um, many of these objects do have a spiritual meaning for these countries. And in fact, I was one of the first last year who brought such one of such pieces back. An empress crown stolen from Ethiopia and we brought it back and we handed it over to the prime minister in Ethiopia. I'm gonna take a break. It is an inside job, you know. There is somebody in it, in a bank or in a museum, who knows about what's going to take place. It's very easy to get somebody inside, very easy. I did these things, you know. You have to find somebody who has problems, you know, has debt or something. 
uh, I trace them where they go, where they go out. And uh, then I bump up to them and say, I'm sorry, you want something to drink? But also a strange thing, they come with their open face. He wants to be noticed. He, he attracts attention. Yes, too much. That's just a taste. The problem with museums is that they are there for the public. They are not, it's not meant to be a thought. So it's very hard to really prevent everybody from, from taking something. You cannot put every painting like the Mona Lisa behind such thick glass. I've never heard of an art theft where people were killed. You know, it's, uh, they shoot people here like it's, you know, it's war. It's not like that. Let's say you have stolen art uh, from a crime like this. You cannot sell it. It's too hot. People died. You cannot sell it. A ridiculous clip. This is a mission impossible. It's really a mission impossible. It is. It's too uh, much of a risk to absolve a guy down with a guy just holding the, uh, a rope. If it goes through his hands, he will drop dead. He has no control. This is... I, I cannot even imagine doing this. He's half naked. There's one case I know of that they did this upsiling. It was a couple of years ago in, in England in a warehouse. They, they upsiled into this warehouse and uh, the robbery took five hours and they stole uh, 200 rare books, amongst them uh, first editions of, uh, of Galileo, for example, worth three million. Uh, he hangs on top of the, uh, yeah, what is it? A case, and he's, yeah, sweaty as hell. But at that time, they didn't have DNA, so it was possible at the time. But now if you do that, they come and get you after, I think, two weeks, they will be at your house. In real, it's very heavy. I think it's even impossible to lift it up the way they do it. You know, you need, need a sort of, sort of head hydraulics, you know, to do this. This replacing is interesting because it does happen. The most spectacular case was in 20 years ago in Venezuela. A guy was walking around visiting art galleries and he wanted to sell them a painting called Odalisque in Red Pants made by Henry Matisse. But everybody laughed him away and they said, look, this is a fake because the real one is in a museum in Venezuela. So everybody laughed and, and got him out. But there was one art dealer who got suspicious. So he called the museum and he said, is this painting still in your museum? And they looked at the painting and then they found out that the painting in the museum was a forgery. So somehow someone had changed the real one for a fake one. Can you imagine you think you have two real paintings, two real Van Goghs and you sell them to a a uh, heavy guy and he Nothing. finds out <laughs> it's fake. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> Things like this have happened, so uh, let's give it, you know, I give it a seven. What do you give it? I give it a four. It's uh, not that is, bad. Yeah, it, yeah. It's fun to watch. <sighs> you never go to your own house after you just stole the painting and uh, him touching everything with his bare hands. He doesn't have a hand glove on. You never touch the painting with your bare hands because of the DNA, fingerprints. A couple of years ago, they found a stolen day car in, in a suitcase in a, in a bus. So the police asked all the passengers, but nobody claimed the painting, of course. So it does happen that they put it in suitcases. Uh, most paintings I've seen have always been in a bag, trash bag or something, or a trash can bag, right? Or a spot bag. You got a warrant? I don't need a warrant. I'm not a cop. But these guys are. The mistake that's often made in Hollywood movies. Interpol does not have agents in the field making arrests. Interpol is an agency that collects information and distributes it around the world. It's very important work, but these, these men and women are sitting behind the desk. But over and over again, Hollywood takes them from their desk, gives them a gun and let them make arrests. So, this just doesn't happen. You know? I know it's true because I got extradited by Interpol. He was talking to the Spanish cops and he never said a word to me and he went away. He just opened the doors at the airport, put me into a plane. I love all the little dots. It's very artistic. 
there are not many art detectives in the world, you know, police officers who, who dedicate themselves to art. Uh, there are a few. Some of them do have knowledge of art, but some of them have no clue. But let's be honest, the way he handles this painting, it's like he, they wouldn't allow him to touch the painting no. like that. I would say a five or six. A three. They're all back on. This is unrealistic, really. And and I never heard of, of a, a CCTV camera being override. I, I think it might have happened, you know, especially Secret Service has probably used this kind of stuff. But I don't know of a, of a museum robbery that this took place. If your security system goes down like an error, I'm sure they have uh, regulations or protocol what they have to do, check everything. You have cameras, obvious and hidden cameras, of course. But what strikes me a lot is that in many cases, um, when a theft happens, I call the police and said, "Where well, is the camera footage? Uh, no, because um, they were repairing cameras. It's like all the cameras in all museums, the whole world, the whole year they are being repaired. He can't write his name or read a book. Safes behind, hidden behind uh, paintings, that does happen. But thieves know that, of course. So that's the first place they look. And if they don't know, the moment they take a painting off the wall to steal it, they see the, the safe and they think, oh my God, we have a bonus. That happened with me a couple of times. I never was looking for a safe. I took a painting. Hey, we got a safe. <laughs> you see? So don't try this at home. Don't do it. The, the door is the most difficult thing because it's very thick and the mechanism and stuff like that. You always go through the wall, underneath the safe, the back of the safe, the weak spot, you know. If that's all, the life is what you wish. I, I listened to music when I was on my way to get, uh, you know, get some adrenaline. I would say like a four. Yeah, three or four. I don't think you've been properly introduced. Sam, it's your neighbor, Mr. Rembrandt. The guy who's standing next to Clooney is based on a real character. His name is Harry Edlinger. As a little kid, a Jewish kid in Germany, he was living in Karlsruhe a few blocks away from the museum where this painting was hanging. And as a child, he wanted to see this painting, but he was not allowed. He was Jewish. They didn't allow him into this museum. A couple of years later, his family uh, fled for the Nazis to the United States. And when the war started, Harry uh, joined the army. And this unit, they had to track down all the art stolen by Adolf Hitler. They went into a salt mine in Alt Aussee in Austria. And Harry, to his surprise, saw this same painting, this Rembrandt. So he couldn't believe it. As an American sergeant, he brought it back himself. What a story. The Nazis stole millions of pieces of art. Uh, there was given an order to blow everything up. But the second man in command from the SS, Carlton Brunner, prevented it. So in the end, this wasn't blown up. They found all these pieces back. This is an interesting scene. Here you see a, a painting called Portrait of a Young Man by Raphael. And this one is considered to be the most important painting still missing from World War II. This one. But um, it probably wasn't in this salt mine to begin with. Even I am still searching for this particular painting. The Nazis did destroy art, but that was modern art, you know. The order was given to destroy them, but it didn't take place. For reality, I would give it like a nine. This painting there, the Duke of Wellington by Francis Goya, was really stolen in 61. And in 62, when this movie was shot, it still was lost. And the makers thought it to be a little in-joke to put it in the movie. The real thief was caught a few years later after this movie. It was not Dr. No, it was a taxi driver from London. It influenced a lot of, of, of thieves. So they steal a painting and then they are going to search for Dr. No to sell it to. But there are not many Dr. No's because why would you buy a stolen painting if you have the money to buy a real one. You cannot show a stolen painting to your friends, to your children. So 
there are not that many Dr. No's. But the police know, so they decide to play along. So if you meet a Dr. No, most likely it's an, uh, an undercover cop. You know, it's James Bond, so let's give it a 10. I, I don't watch that many Hollywood movies, you know, because with the kind of work I do, sometimes I have the feeling I'm in one of myself. I once recovered a stolen Picasso worth 70 million, but before handing it back to the owner, I put it on my wall for one night. So imagine a stolen Picasso worth 70 million on my wall. There was only one guy in the world who knows what it is to have these kind of stolen paintings on his wall. So I called Oki and I said, you have no idea what's on my wall. He said, well, tell me. I said, a stolen Picasso worth 70 million. So he went quiet for a few seconds and then he said, is there any chance you're leaving your home tonight? <laughs>